time for us to check back in and see what happens next with Alex Stewart. If you missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. Alex, you've talked about how it was when you first got married, the various places you lived, and about buying your own land, but you haven't talked much about how you and Margie got along. I was 20 years old when we got married, and she was 16. We were married 62 years, 4 months, and 14 days when she died. I never thought but that she would outlive me, that she would put me away. But she's been gone for years now, and I'm still here. I don't guess they was ever two people that got along better than we did. Of course, we quarreled and jawed at different times, but I never struck that woman a time in my life. If we couldn't agree on something, one of us would just walk off. The worst thing I remember was when I whooped Mary, our oldest girl. Margie didn't like it, and she got all over me for that. I was in the kitchen getting me a drink out of a little gourd dipper when she started fussing at me because I whooped that child. That was the prettiest little dipper ever I seed, and Margie thought the world of it. When she commenced fussing, I just threw that gourd down and busted it all to pieces. Oh, buddy, that made her mad. She grabbed me by the arm and bit me. It just burned and hurt, and I pulled up my shirt sleeve to see what she had done to it. It was just as red as a turkey snout where she had bit me. Oh, she commenced pitying me then, and I just pulled my shirt sleeve down and said, You get away from me and let me alone. Now, that's the only time that we ever had any real racket at all that I ever remember. There wasn't a working -er woman in the county, and if she ever had an enemy, I never heard tell of it. She'd go to meet, and every time she had a chance, I couldn't have got a better woman. Did she ever complain about you making liquor? Oh, yeah, she was on my hide all the time about that. That's one thing that made me think so much of her. She tried to get me to do the right thing all the time. I couldn't afford to quarrel with her, but I said, Now, I can't keep my youngins here and send them to school and clothe them, feed them, and everything else unless I've got something to do it with. I said, We've got to live some way, and I don't aim to steal for them until I have to. I said, I'm going to make some liquor to give my youngins schooling, even if they put me in jail. That's how come I got into making liquor, but I never would let the boys have none. I never was caught and never did pay out a nickel in my life. I followed it for over 40 years. Did your boys ever help you make whiskey? No, they never helped me make a drop of liquor. I wouldn't let them. Never seed but one of them under the influence of liquor in my life. Some boys come along down here one time, and they got one of my boys to go with them up the road here. They give him some whiskey and then some beer to drink, and that got him drunk. When Margie smelled liquor on him, she just walked out and got a switch about three feet long. I'll swear she liked to have wore that boy out. Gee, God, did she give him a whipping. From that day to this, if he ever drank another drop of liquor, I don't know it. Now, that's the only time I ever recollect her whooping one of the children. I whooped Mary, like I told you. I didn't have sense enough to raise a child, hardly. But Margie soon learnt me about that. A good talk is better for a youngin' than all the whoopings you can give. Learn it to mind you and don't promise it something and fail to follow through. You never had any trouble with them minding you? No, they all minded me. They'll mind me today just about as good as they did back then. Yeah, even Sam will. I don't care what I tell him to do. He'll do it. How old is he? He'll soon be 66 years old. He could be a draw in Social Security now if he would, but he won't do it. And all of your children live nearby? Yeah, we had 11 children, and the nine that are living are close by. Mary, the oldest, lives up there on the ridge where she's raised. Sadie lives over here in Morristown, and of course Sam lives here on the farm. Foy lives about three miles down the valley in what they call Sink Valley, and Frank spent over 20 years working in a chair factory in Morristown. Vol lives close by and helps Sam run the sawmill. Mutt and Lloyd live here with me, and Edith lives up here on Fox Branch. Yeah, Edith. She's the baby one. She works up here in Virginia at the sewing factory. She's been up there going on 20 years. She'll soon be ready for parole retirement. 
She'll soon be discharged from it. She comes by after work and helps out. Washes, cleans the house, and helps Mutt and Lloyd cook sometimes. Oh, she's a worker, Edith is. Yeah, they've all stayed close, and I've got 26 grandchildren, 42 great-grandchildren, and four great-great-grandchildren, and most of them are around here, too. I'm just lucky to have them all so close. Alex had mentioned his two deceased children only a time or two, and he never dwelt on the subject, nor did he give any details. I sensed it was a topic he found hard to talk about, but I felt I ought to pursue it nevertheless. I did so during one of our talks in December 1984, a few weeks before his 94th birthday. I soon learned that the passage of those many years had not swept away the hurt he felt from the loss of these children. His voice broke, and it was the first time I saw him unable to speak. He searched for a match to relight his pipe, and I pretended not to notice his distress. In a little while, he continued. The little baby... He was two months old. He took sick one evening, and he laid there and groaned right on up until he died. I've wondered aside about that. That little thing couldn't have committed no kind of sin, and him a suffering like that. But the Bible says we all have to suffer. The just has got to suffer the same as the sinner. What was the little girl's name? Alveda was her name. She was 12 years old when she took the measles and pneumonia. The doctor came along every day, and the last time he come, he said there was no use of him coming back. She died, I guess, before he got out of sight. She was a fun little kid, and oh, how well she done in school. I never saw anybody who could learn like she did. The teacher said they had the least trouble with her of any student they ever had, but she had to leave here. Alex continued to have difficulty talking about his little girl. He tried to talk matter-of-factly to disassociate himself emotionally from the story he was relating, but he couldn't do so. Tears came to the old man's eyes. He was determined to finish his comments, however, and after tamping more tobacco in his pipe, he did continue. Fate Johnson made her coffin. He was a good hand to make coffins, and Steve Gibson preached her funeral. She's buried down the valley here, about three-quarters of a mile, along with the little boy. That's where I buried Margie. I put up a marker for each of the children, and I've got a double one for me and Margie. That's where I'll be, beside Margie and my children. Working for a Living, Chapter 6 I've rolled in the bed many a night studying how I was going to feed my family the next day. From the time he was a child, Alex roamed the hills and hollows of Newman's Ridge, exploring all their secrets. It was the home of his ancestors, and he understood and loved the isolated coves and hollows, the forested glens, the steep pastures, and the stump-dotted fields. His greatest aspiration was to own a piece of land on the ridge. In his early years, the possibility of realizing that dream must have seemed very remote. But this longing, coupled with the dismal prospect of spending the remainder of his life as a tenant farmer, pushed him into taking the big jump. Now he had a hundred acres of land and a six hundred dollar debt. By today's standards, the amount is inconsequential, but at the same time, it was staggering. If he had worked for hire six days a week at the going rate of 50 cent per day, applying every cent he earned toward the debt, it would have taken more than four years to pay for the land, not to mention the interest which would have, have accrued during that time. Undaunted, Alex had agreed to make full payment for the land in only two years. Much of the acreage was too steep and rocky to be useful, and virtually all of it had to be cleared before any farming could be done. The land was so isolated it could only be reached by a trail running through the woods and up the mountain that led to the Stewart's tiny one-room cabin, home to a family that eventually numbered 13. He was faced with a difficult decision. If he spent all his time working for others, his land would lie fallow and be worthless to him. If, on the other hand, he worked only on clearing and planting his land, he would receive no money and no crop for months, making it impossible for him to feed his family during the interim. Typically, he chose to do both. 
He worked at clearing and improving his land during the summer months when he could spare the time, and when the opportunity presented itself, he worked for others to earn enough to sustain his family. He worked variously as a coal miner, railroad man, logger, stave maker, log rafter, sawmiller, watermill operator, perler, well digger, and steel driver. In addition, he mastered dozens of crafts. There was no marauding Indians on Newman's Ridge at the time Alex and Margie moved there, but in other ways, the conditions were very close to those of the frontier. An undomesticated piece of land, a cabin, a sled full of household chattels, a handful of tools, and an immeasurable amount of grit were the possessions that Alex and Margie shared with their pioneering forefathers. Years later, I asked him to tell me about those times of toil and struggle. With a family of 11, it seems you would have been awfully crowded with only one small room. Well, we wasn't crowded so much. We had three beds in it, and all but four of my children was boys, and they slept together. Three or more in a bed. We had a little loft, and some of them slept up there. All my kids was born in that house but one. I had a fireplace for heat, and we done our cooking on that little stove that I was telling you about. We carried our water from a spring down at the foot of the hill, had to carry it right straight up that hill. I sure done many a day's hard work there. It'd take plenty of corn to do us, and I'd put up two or three stacks of hay there with a mowing blade. Didn't have no mowing machine, wasn't able to buy it, so I'd cut it with a mowing blade and stack it. I'd sell some corn every spring. We never did have to buy nothing to eat. That's the best land to grow taters and beans that I ever saw in my life. And we had one of the best apple orchards around. Had about 35 to 40 trees, and they wasn't a one that didn't have good apples. Now it's a getting to where the bugs won't let nothing grow. It seems that you kept busy doing something all the time, even when it was too wet to work the land. What were some of the things you did to make money or get food for your family? Oh, son, I worked at about everything you can think of. I was always busy. I never in my life had any trouble finding something to do. Why, I've made a whole lot of money digging roots and herbs and sang, ginseng. I've raised sang. Down below the house, there were several outcroppings of big limestone rock, and everywhere you saw one of them, well, you found a big, nice black walnut tree. I planted sang under them trees, and that made the prettiest sang patch you ever saw. One of the earliest money crops in southern Appalachia was the root of the ginseng plant. In going through the old tools of mountain homesteads, one often finds long, narrow ginseng hoes used by the old timers to dig this valuable herb. Its primary market has traditionally been in China where it was thought to be a cure for many diseases. The roots often grow in the shape of a human body and the more they resemble this form, the more valuable they are. The word ginseng is reportedly of Chinese origin and means likeness of man. Some ginseng roots have quite literally been worth their weight in gold. In addition to its medicinal qualities, the ginseng root is considered by many to be an effective aphrodisiac. Although the Chinese have long cultivated the plant, the wild variety found in the southern Appalachian region was and is worth considerably more than that which is grown domestically. The plant is small, has three leaves at the top, and grows in deep woods. Direct sunlight will kill it. Although I had been familiar with ginseng and ginseng digging in a cursory way, I read up on the subject after talking to Alex and discovered one authority statement that the best ginseng grew under and around black walnut trees. As usual, Alex knew what he was doing. Hunting sang usually occurs in September when the leaves start to turn. When they are bright red, berries appear. I was never sure whether or not sang digging extended all the way back to pioneer times. I thought I might get a clue from Alex. Did your grandfather Stuart know about ginseng, and did he dig and sell it? Oh yeah, he dug it, but he wasn't so hot for it like I was. Mostly he'd look for it when he was out in the woods looking for timber to make his chairs and things. He'd come back with a pocket full of sang nearly every time. Yeah, he sure knowed what sang was. It brought a pretty p good price back when I was hunting it, from 25 to 35 cents an ounce. That's about $5 a pound. 
and now it's bringing from 150 to 175 dollars a pound of course them roots have to be well dried and it gets awful light it takes a heap of sang roots to make a pound i've spent the whole day many a time hunting for sang I'd go for miles and miles on the north side of this ridge, and some days I wouldn't make it more than 10 or 15 cents. They was so many people out looking for it that it got scarce, but if you could find a patch of it, you could do pretty good. Alex, all the old ginseng diggers I've talked with dug the root to sell. I understand the Indians used it, and I'm wondering if it was ever used by the white people of this area. Oh yeah, they'd eat it. Some people would. They claimed it was a good blood medicine. I've heard it said that saying wasn't a fit for no kind of disease, but I say it is. It would surprise you if you could just see the saying I've eat. Just put it in my pocket and eat it. It's a good stomach medicine. You can be burning up in your stomach and not feeling good and eat you a little of that and doggone in a few minutes it's all over with. It'll purify your blood if you'll eat enough of it. Alex had often talked about pearl hunting in the Clinch River, which flows a couple of miles from the foot of Newman's Ridge, and I was most anxious to hear the details of his involvement in this most interesting industry. From the late 1800s until the 1930s, Tennessee was among the nation's leading producers of freshwater pearls, and an appreciable number of these came from the Clinch. Researchers have discovered that this stream produced more different types of bivalve mussels or mollusks than any stream in the world. One study discovered 45 species in a single small area and one authority, A.R. Kahn, states that the finest freshwater pearls known to man came from the Clinch River. In the 1930s, some of these pearls were bringing as much as 6,000 each on the wholesale market. The pearl, officially designated by Tennessee as the state gem, is formed when a grain of sand or some other irritant enters the shell, prompting the mussel to surround the foreign matter with a shield or protective covering. The resulting pearls range in color from pink, bronze, and blue to lustrous white. Only a small percentage of mussels contain pearls, but the shell itself contains a lustrous inside lining, mother of pearl, which came to be valued for the making of buttons. Here again, the shells from the Clinch River were considered superior, and according to local newspaper accounts, they were used to make buttons for dignitaries throughout the world, including several kings and queens. Even if one found no pearls during a day's hunt, the shells could still be marketed. Several years ago, you told me about hunting mussels and pearls down here in the river. Were they plentiful in this area? Oh yeah, tons of them. I was the first man ever invented a box to find them, least ways that I've got any history of. I just made one myself. I was raised partly on the river, and I was plenty well acquainted with it. I'd get down there and roll my britches up, and I'd get in water so deep you couldn't see them, I said. Doggone, I'll make me something so I can see them. I made a box about 18 inches square with a piece of glass in the bottom and with glass sides. You could put it down the water just so the water don't come up over the top of it and you could see four or five feet in all directions. Well, enough that you could pick up a pin if there's airy one down there. It wasn't long before a lot of people was making them muscle boxes. I ought to have got paid for that. Well, in a way, I did get paid by finding so many more pearls. Where did you sell the pearls, and how much did you get for them? They bought them at Sneedville, Kyle's Ford, and any of the little towns. They'd ship them out. It wasn't any trouble to get rid of them. The most I ever got for one was $18. I sold most of them for 3 or $4. There was a feller down here at Sneedville that got $1,000 for one. That's the most I ever heard of one bringing around here. Me and another feller was pearl hunting one day, and we got our boat full of mussel shells. He had his in one end, and I had mine in t'other. The, the use of the word t'other for the other was not uncommon among the old folk in most remote areas of Appalachia, but Alex seldom used it. It seemed that when he got excited during the narration of one of his stories, he was more apt to use the older form. It was getting late, and we had five or six hundred pounds of mussels, and we unloaded them on the bank and started to bile them down. 
We put a lard can full and heat it until it struck a ball, and then we opened them up and see if we had a pearl. We had two lard cans, and I'd boil mine, and he'd boil his. We'd done that all day, and it was getting late, and his other feller said he was tired and was going home. He just had a handful of mussels left, and he gave them to me, and when I boiled them open, I found a great big pearl. That was the only one found all day, Alex chuckled. While the bottom of this river was just covered with them big mussels, you could stand in one place and pull them out. People would come here from all around to get them mussel shells. They'd come in here and camp. It was something to see in the summertime, people all along the river hunting mussels. Some of them would bring big vats, sort of like molasses pans, to boil them in. After they went through the shells looking for pearls, they'd pile them up and they'd come in here and haul them off in trucks. They'd pay $100 a ton for the shells for buttons, knife handles, pistol grips, and chicken feed. They'd grind up the outside part and it sure would make the chickens lay. It would might near make an old rooster lay. Did you use any of the shells yourself? Yeah, I've made buttons and pistol grips and so forth out of them. There's a woman down here in Knoxville that I made some pearl crosses for, and law, she was tickled to death with them. How do you make a pearl button? To make buttons, you'd take a hammer and a little chisel and keep chipping that shell till you got it as small and round as you wanted. It would be rough and jagged, then you'd take a file and smooth it up. I'd hold it under water when I was filing it because if you don't, it will just gum up and you can't do anything with it. See, the water floats that fiber away. It gets it out of your way so you can see what you're doing. But your water will get milky in a little while and you'll have to change it out ever so often. I made me a little bit to bore the button holes with. A certain type of mussel is a very fine food served in many restaurants. Were these mussels edible? No, but if you got them before they tainted, they's good hog feed. They'd fatten a hog quicker than corn. They sort of a cousin to the oyster. The Clinch River has long been known for the thousands of log rafts that once were floated down its winding course to the sawmills located in Clinton and Chattanooga. Clinton, with a population of only a few hundred, had six active sawmills in the late 1800s to 1900s to the early 1900s. The largest, Fisher Burnett, employed 50 men, and early reports indicate there were times when as many as 100 rafts were tied on the banks of the Clinch at the Clinton Mills. Some of the country's best timber grew in the rich, moist hollows and coves on land drained by the Clinch. Roads were always poor, and bridges were not sturdy enough to stand the weight of a load of these great logs. Even if the roads and bridges had been adequate, land transportation was impractical. It would have taken two or three weeks to deliver a big log by an ox-drawn wagon from Hancock County to Chattanooga, a distance of about 130 miles, and the price received would have been negligible. Hence, river transportation was the only economical and practical means of transporting the larger logs to the mills. The logs were bound together with long poles called binders, and a wooden peg was driven through a hole bolted into each log. A single raft usually consisted of 200 giant logs, and often two of these rafts were joined together to form a double raft. Two oarsmen were required on the front of a double raft and two in the rear. They worked in careful concert to prevent the raft from running on sandbars or shallow rocks and to keep the raging current from smashing the rafts against the banks. The key man in this operation was the steersman who had to know the river intimately. The raft could only be floated when the tide was up, when the river was in a semi-flood stage, and this usually occurred in the winter or early spring. When the river was in this condition, the rocks and shoals that usually protruded were covered with water. The steersman had to know where these shallows were, and long hours of toil could be lost in a few seconds if the steersman erred. The job required skill, stamina, decisiveness, and a quick mind. A good steersman was a much-respected person among the loggers and rafters. 
One such person was a young man from the Cumberland foothills near Livingston, Tennessee. Born in 1871 in a rented log cabin, this young lad had all the qualities necessary to make an expert oarsman, but his days of rafting logs on the Cumberland River were short-lived. After delivering a raft of logs to Nashville in the 1880s, he saw his first newspaper and decided to educate himself. He got his law degree, served in the Tennessee legislature, practiced law, was appointed to a judgeship, and eventually became a United States congressman, serving for a quarter of a century. In 1930, he was elected to the United States Senate, and in 1933, President Franklin D. Roosevelt appointed him Secretary of State. He was presented the Nobel Peace Prize in 1945 and is called the Father of the United Nations. His name was Cordell Hull. Few jobs in the Appalachian Mountains were more demanding and more dangerous than law grafting. My grandfather, Marcellus Moss Rice, made a few trips down to Chattanooga in the late 1800s. Many times I've listened with awe to his stories of the days and nights on the freezing river of those who died of exposure and pneumonia. Law grafting was one subject I had not discussed with Alex, though he mentioned it when talking about his grandfather. I had no doubt that he could speak eloquently on this mountain activity. Alex, did you ever run log rafts down the river? Yes, sir. I've run log rafts and cross ties, too. I've helped put log rafts together down here at the mouth of Panther Creek when it was so cold that the water, when it splashed on you, would freeze in less than five minutes. You had to put them two binders across them logs and drive wood pegs to hold them together. Every time you struck that peg, a water would splash up through the cracks in the logs, and pretty soon you was wet. Why, many a time I've seen my overalls froze so stiff they would have stood by themselves. Were the logs mostly oak? They was mostly oak, but oak was so heavy that they wouldn't float by themselves, so you have to put in a few poplar. The poplar was a good deal lighter. It was awful hard work, but it paid a dollar a day. Now, I thought that was big money. Fifty cents, even twenty-five cents was what I'd been used to. They generally sold the logs in Clinton, but sometimes they took them on to Chattanooga. When you got to Clinton, they didn't need as many hands from there on down, and they'd let some of us come on back. How long did it take to go to Clinton? Just depended on the tide. If you got the right kind of tide, you'd make it in about three days. Of course, you've got to run day and night. Did you get any sleep during this time? Oh, you didn't get to sleep none, maybe a few winks the second night. You had to be on the job. If the tide got too high and wild, you tied up for a while of the night. You'd sleep a little setting up, but I've known of them going six days and six nights and never tying up. It depended on your water. If it got too slow, you had to tie up, and if it got too high, you had to tie up. Even if you had the time, there wasn't much of a place to sleep, was there? Oh, they's just a little old bunk with a little straw throat in there. They had a little stove you cooked on. That's all you had. When you got to go to town, they had a little boat come out and pull in your raft and measure it up. If they's crowded sometime, it'd take a day or two to get your legs measured. Every one of them logs had a peg that stuck up through the binder about that far. He measures two or three inches. And they had a trick, too, to go along cutting the tops off the pegs, just like you'd cut a cornstalk with your pocket knife. They had two fellers pulling them in and another feller standing there measuring. When you got to Clinton, they gave you three dollars and turned you loose. How did you get home from there? We'd catch a train over to Knoxville and then walk on home from there. It was about 60 miles home from Knoxville. How long did it take you to walk that 60 miles? Just one day. You had to stir early, and there wasn't no rest along the road. You had to keep packing down on it. Of course, it would be late at night when we'd get in. It wasn't no easy way to make money. There wasn't no easy way back then. If they was, I never found it. Alex, I believe you told me once that you spent some time working on the railroad. Yeah, I worked on the railroad. The coal company bought a whole lot of mountain land back from Norton, and they had to build their own railroad track line back in there to get their coal out. 
We built the railroad, used a pick and a shovel, that's all we had, and sledgehammers to bust the rock. I worked there in the fall after the crops were laid by, and on up till way after Christmas, I started working there before I married, and would go back up there nearly every fall. How far was it to where you worked, and how did you get there? It was 75 miles to where I worked, above Norton. Back then, there wasn't no cars, of course, and I'd walk it. After work one Friday, I decided to come home. I lit out a walking, and I got over here about two miles from Jonesville, Virginia, and it got dark and went to kind of drizzling rain. I couldn't see the road hardly. Didn't have no light. I just walked off the road eight or ten steps, made up a little fire, and laid down by it. I was tired. I happened to look up and saw this great burning thing a flying through the air, and later I heard that it was Haley's Comet. It scared the chickens, and they started crowing for daylight. Haley's Comet is documented to have appeared several times in the spring and summer of 1910, the first sighting being May 10. At that time, Alex was 19 years old. Well, I just got up and started on towards home, and pretty soon it started getting daylight, and I had to wade Powell's River. There wasn't no boat nor nothing there. I just rolled my breeches legs up as high as I could and come on across. And that river was cold. When I got out, I thought my legs would bust. When I got home, Mommy was getting dinner over with. She told me to come on in and eat. And I told her that I was too tired and sleepy to eat. I was plum wore out after working 12 hours, then walking nearly 75 miles. I slept two or three hours, and then I felt all right. Another time I got a job building a railroad over around Big Stone Gap. It was 52 miles over there, and I left here one morning long before daylight of walking, and before dark I pulled in there. I laid on a sand pile that night, and the next morning I went up and asked the foreman for a job. He worked a bunch of convicts in a rock pile, and he said, Well, you're too small to hold out for work like that, handling them big rocks. So he gave me a job carrying water for the convicts and for the other workers. He gave me a dollar a day. There was a great big spring down there at the foot of the hill, and I carried water from there. They had a steam-powered drill to drill holes in the rock so they could shoot them. We always drove the steel with just a hammer, you know, but they had this steam-powered drill, the first I ever seed. They's a feller named John Cox, an awful friendly feller who run the steam machine. Well, them steel bits would get dull and need sharpening every time they drilled two holes, and Cox asked the boss, could I take them big bits down to the blacksmith and have them sharpened? The boss said, all right, and I packed them down there and was back before they knowed it. The very next day, they had this big 10-foot drill, and the boss said, We'll get two of them convicts to load that 10-foot drill on the wagon and let you take it and have it sharpened. I said, Why, well, I can pack that on my back. He said, You can play hell. That's just what he said. By God, if you think you can carry it, take it and go on. I took me an old gunny sack and put it on my shoulder, and I packed that big drill to the blacksmith shop, had it sharpened, and brought it back, and the boss said, I'll be damned. You're more of a man than I thought you was. I'm going to raise your wages. Well, I said, I sure do thank you. Then I said, why don't you put a shop here so we can sharpen all our tools and bits, and we won't have to carry everything backwards and forwards so much. He said, hell, we ain't got no blacksmith. Who could do the work? I says, if you get me the tools, I can do the work. He had a shop over in East Stone Gap, and he sent over there and got the tools. The first thing he did was to give me a two-foot jumper. That's the drill you start off with. Well, I fired up the forge, heated my metal, and hammered out that drill just as pretty as you ever seed, and I tempered it just right. He took it and put it on the drill, and that bit just went right on down through that rock. He pulled it out and looked at it, and you couldn't tell that it had ever been drilled with. I give it the right temper, and it ain't got dull at all. He said, I see where you're going to stay, and I'm aiming to raise your pay again. He raised me to two fifty a day, and I just stayed there and run the blacksmith shop. I had a pie from then on. The other blacksmith had to sharpen his bit after every two holes was drilled, but they always drilled three holes with mine before they needed sharpening. That's the first time ever I worked in steel. 
course, I'd worked back home with iron. So another fascinating peek into the life of Alex Stewart. Probably the thing that jumped out at me most in this part of the book is the way that Alex worked. What a hard worker. All that diff all those different jobs. Who about the pearls? I'm fascinated by that. It makes me wonder if, if they still harvest those mussel shells today. If you know that, please share that. Fascinating. But all the different variety of jobs that he did, all that walking that he did, of course, as he said, that was in the days when people walked. They walked everywhere they went. Yes, people had uh, mules and horses and oxen, but a lot of times those animals were only used for their their work, you know, thinking about working on the farm um, and would not have been used just to, to ride back and forth and all those. You walked. That's just what you did. You walked. So that's, that's just fascinating. I enjoyed hearing about how him and Margie started out and and about how they got along and only that one little ruckus, he called it, or one little racket, where they, she got mad at him and he broke the dipper and then she bit him. It reminded me of this story of Pap told me about this man and woman that lived in his community and, and was married a long time, but they, they would fight a lot. Uh, the man mostly was kind of rambunctious, but he was telling, and he, he told this tale on himself that one time he'd come home and their dinner wasn't ready, supper wasn't ready, whichever one it was, if it was the middle of the day or the evening, I can't remember, and that um, he was mad and he wanted he wanted to know why it wasn't ready and she said she'd been busy doing whatever she'd been doing you know and she was working on it but it wasn't ready but he got mad and he picked up one of the plates and threw it at the wall and broke it and said now how do you like that I want my food on the table and so that was the funny part that she picked up the next plate and threw it and against the wall and said now how do you like that you know she wasn't gonna let him get away with anything which is really silly because they broke their plates anyway it reminded me of that uh, the little ruckus but I enjoyed that part and 62 years being married 62 years what a, an amazing feat and and the children that they had so they had 11 kids and nine lived to adulthood my granny Gazzy had nine had 11 kids and nine lived to adulthood so that's very similar although both of her that died died as you know as uh, infants not as the girl that Alex you know was obviously choked up about and who could blame him that that they lost at 12 years so sad such a sad story amazing when you think about them all living in that small little house just a different time and then when he asked him you know well wasn't that hard he's Alex is like no it wasn't hard we had plenty of room it's such a drastic difference in the way we live today we're so blessed to have room to spread out uh, we by no means live in a mansion but we have three bedrooms and two kids so I mean you know we it's just such a different uh, time than those and and we've we've been so spoiled by what we what we do have today in our modern world but it's amazing to look back at that at, at things like this accounts where they lived in those little small places but then to hear alex say no we actually we wasn't really all that crowded and you're like what in a one-room cabin you wasn't really that crowded but it was just a different time all the talk about ginseng was very interesting too and people call it that saying that was what he was calling it that's people that's common here i have a video about ginseng my brother my older brother steve used to go saying hunting a lot when we were young and that's how he made some of his spending money so you can check that video out i don't hear many people talk about it today uh, like in those days it's another one of those things probably it's fell out of fashion although i know there is certainly people who still who do still hunt saying um, one of the Steve's buddies I know in recent years, one year he made $10,000. Now he spent a lot of time in the woods and um, he didn't have a full-time job and those kind of things, but there is money to be had doing that. I don't know as much today because there's so many rules and regulations that surround it today and compared to the days when um, Alex was talking about. Another interesting part, uh, the last thing I'll share is, so saying, that is very common here that you hear people say, but when he was saying bull, I would say bull, bull, like to bull water. He was saying, Alex said it, bile, like bile them cabbage down is what it reminds me of, but B-I-L-E is how he was saying it, bile. And I say bull, bull. I say bull, so if I'm talking about a, um, a, male cow or a bull and water i say it the same way bull and bull that's how i say so that's just the difference and uh, it's interesting how words are pronounced in different areas even in different areas of appalachia and especially with different 
um, generations as time goes on, how those things change. But I hope you'll leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you from this part of the book, what you found interesting. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday so that we can find out what happens next to Alex Stewart.